Hi, we're here with Jan Irvin. I'm Tony Myers, a member of the Tragedy and Hope online magazine and community. And I'm here interviewing Jan. Had the opportunity, lucky enough. So, yeah, I just want to go over some of the points you covered yesterday in your talk at the uh, Free Your Mind Conference, Ruba Hall in Philadelphia, that Mark Passio uh, put together. Uh, you presented on the trivium and the importance of the trivium and also how it's been taken away in our education system and how it's a method by which we can uh, come to certainty and understanding in our world. And I just wanted to, I was wondering if you could present uh, information yesterday in the talk. I was wondering if you could give a quick overview of what the trivium is exactly. Like who uh, developed the trivium and uh, the relationship, the three points in succession. Well, the trivium was primarily developed by Aristotle in its current form, and then there's another part, that, the quadrivium, that was created by Pythagoras even earlier than that. But the trivium is specifically grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the... And you stress that order. Yes, right. and, the, and the order is very important. Grammar is sort of like the building blocks or the, the bricks of a house, and logic would be like the house built, all the contradictions removed, the bricks are standing, they're sticking together, you know, just like words in a sentence. And so you have the house and then rhetoric would be like an architect explaining how that house was built to someone else so that they could effectively build a house themselves. And if you take any of those things out of order, obviously you can't have a finished house before you know what the bricks are and the parts to the house that go together. So that's very important. And uh, the trivium, trivium and quadrivium combined are what is known as the classical seven liberal arts. Okay. What's the, uh, could you explain the relationship of the Pythagorean uh, triangle to the trivium? Well, the Pythagorean triangle, which is the five, three, four triangle, the right. five represents the senses, the three represents the trivium, and the four represents the quadrivium. Okay. And I should also add that the quadrivium itself is composed of mathematics, geometry, music, and astronomy, also specifically in that order. Okay, right. So the trivium and the quadrivium both have a specific order, and when any time that's taken out of order, the relationships fall apart. Right, okay. exactly. You know, and my personal feeling is that secret societies and the like, and the mystery schools who traditionally teach the trivium and quadrivium, like if you look in Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma on page 861, you'll see the trivium listed there, and it's listed out of order. I think he's got grammar, rhetoric, logic. And I think that in many places, either the... And they also use me. certain concepts or symbols well, to, yeah, I think that are in, different. In certain areas, I think that the trivium is... Inten or both of them are intentionally taken out of order because by doing so, the trivium no longer works as a functioning system and then inhibits the person's ability to use it in a fully functioning manner. They'll still have a large manner of critical thinking, right. but it, it's a functioning system that goes sort of in a cycle or in a loop and it constantly repeats itself when it's grammar, logic, rhetoric. But if you take them out of order, that falls apart. And the trivium, if you look at the old symbols of the trivium, it's this sort of roundish, round-sided triangle with three roads coming in, and that's what right. the trivium means. It means it's three roads crossing or three roads meeting. Okay. And, um, you know, so that's basically input processing and output of information and how we properly deal with that and by taking any of these things out of order you can't have input before output right, right. so you ha it has to be in a specific order could you uh, define the terms autodidactic and autonomy and um, how do these relate these concepts relate to one another and also to well, the trivium audit, uh, an autodidact is someone who is self-educated and uh, Autonomy is basically someone who is self-governed and how they relate is that the trivium in and of itself teaches one how to critically think and how to govern one's self and one's thoughts and one's emotions and inter interactions with the outside world which leads to directly to autonomy or sovereignty and uh, autonomy or sovereignty is what is necessary on top of critical thinking so that we can live in a functioning society without uh, people that don't have our best interests at heart. Right. Can you explain the concept of the five W's plus how and specific why and how? Sure. Well, the five W's plus how 
is who, what, where, when, and why. Who, what, where, and when are the grammar aspect, why is the logic aspect, and how is the rhetoric aspect. Who, what, where, and when is how we gather knowledge or of you know, like the parts of language or the parts of a building or a car or whatever that we're dealing with. That's the who, what, where, and when. Why is like having a house built. We understand that, you know, to, for a house to stand properly, it has to have a strong foundation. Why? Because it'll fall down if it doesn't. And why does an engine or why does a car work? Uh, or, or not, that's a bad example. Uh, you know, why are these things put together this way? See, what why is and what understanding is, which is the logic aspect, logic or dialectic, is the identification of the items that you're dealing with or the words, letters that you're dealing with without contradiction. And so it is the process of removing the contradiction so that we have understanding of the parts or the knowledge that we were dealing with. You can't have understanding without knowledge first. Right. You have to know the parts, then you have understanding. And once you have the understanding and you know why, then you can go on to how, which is expressing that knowledge or that knowledge and understanding to someone else, which then it becomes wisdom. Right. How does logic, the second R of the trivium, uh, and specific the logical fallacies, help as a uh, mental antivirus scan? Well, logic acts as a mental antivirus scanner because you're able to see the false rhetoric that's coming at you from somebody else. Like, if you're watching TV and somebody says that, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a valid example right now. I can't think of anything. You know, if you just hear them say, oh, well, this person is wrong because they're a Republican or because they're a Democrat or because they wear a pink shirt or they're a hippie or this or that, that is what is known as an ad hominem attack or attacking the man. Instead of dealing with the specific information that that person is dealing with, they attack a characteristic about that person. And so you automatically know that that's a false argument against that person. There's many of them. There's about 22 primary ones. Uh, like Dr. Michael Lavozier works with a list of about 42 and you know there's probably at least 90 or 100 or maybe even 200 identified. There's many more out there and possible because hmm, more can always be created and figured out. And uh, we also have, you know, many people are familiar with the fallacy or have heard of the fallacy, you know, circular belief or circular logic. And what that is, that's the fallacy of begging the question. So if, let's say, if I say, I know God exists, it says so, or I know God exists, it has this, I have this book right here that says so. And somebody else, you know, comes up to you and is trying to talk to you about that and you only refer back to that same single book as proof of your beliefs or whatever, that is circular reasoning. You can't go back to the same source to prove your argument. You have to substantiate your argument with other outside sor sources and that uh, otherwise it is just it's false logic. Um, there are <clears throat> there are other really important ones like the red herring which basically in older times and probably even today when they're training hunting dogs, especially foxhounds, to uh, go after the fox when they're testing the hound to see if the hound is ready for putting to work, what they'll do is during the fox hunt they will drag a fish, a red herring, across the trail to see if they can divert the dog onto a different trail away from the fox. So this becomes known as the red herring. So that's the same in, in logic when you're having a conversation with somebody and you see politicians do this stuff all the time. Um, if Donald Rumsfeld, <coughs> excuse me, if Donald Rumsfeld is asked if he's a lizard and he says, well, you know, let me tell you a story, and he goes off to this whole discussion about him and his wife off in a hotel somewhere and never even answers the question, that's known as a red herring. And that's a very standard uh, practice that you'll see politicians do when they're given a specific question on a specific topic, you know, and they'll pretend to answer it and they'll divert the whole conversation and just kind of 
you know, use smoke and mirrors, and then people think, oh, well, yeah, did they answer the question? You know, and, and in fact, they intentionally diverted the topic. Right. And what's the importance of making that explicit? Well, the the idea behind getting explicit knowledge of what the fallacies are. See, when you understand, when you've studied the fallacies, go online and search logical fallacies and just read them and you'll begin to immediately be able to apply them in any information that you're taking in. And what happens is, from going from implicit to explicit knowledge, you get you get a clarity and understanding of the things that you're dealing with, really. So when you get when you get from Implicit, well, implicit is basically your intuition. It should be the only the first step. Right. But it's not what you rely on to base your decisions and your information on, your knowledge on. That's the first step. You say, aha, here's this idea. Now it's not insignificant. Fact check it. Right. And so you should be able to go through and, and take it from step A to step B and, and you know, find basically who, what, where, when, why, and how right. before you express that, or why, before you express the how to anyone else. But explicit knowledge, by having explicit knowledge, if somebody is lying to you or giving you false information, you have a methodology of going through and say, oh, that's an ad hominem, oh, this is a red herring, this is, you know, a uh, straw man argument, this is begging the question, the gambler's fallacy, all of these different fallacies uh, appeal to authority or non sequitur. And this gives you explicit knowledge of how you were lied to rather than having a funny feeling. I just went to the used car dealership and I really like this car, but I don't know, I got this funny feeling, you know, and what that is, is that should only be the signal. Your emotions, your, your sensory input is telling you, eh, maybe you should look into this more. So by understanding the logical fallacies, you're actually able to run through a process in your mind instantaneously, really, that says, oh, that one's incorrect, that one's incorrect, oh, he's using a appeal to emotion, he's, you know, he's using circular reasoning, he's saying, you know, if I get this, this car, I'm going to have all the ladies, and, you know, it's like a beer commercial, you watch a beer commercial, they've always got the pretty blonde or blue brunette with the blue eyes there in the swimsuit, you know, you drink a beer, and aha, uh -huh, suddenly a beautiful woman is there, that's a, an appeal to emotion fallacy, or an appeal to, you're not getting any, unless you're, you're having this, uh, this, crappy uh, beer typically is what the commercials are surrounded around. I don't think I've ever seen high quality beers needing that sort of false rhetoric advertising. Oh, in what ways do secret societies communicate these ideas? Well, so secret societies in not necessarily the highest levels of like the Freemasons and stuff, they will teach the Trivium and Quadrivium. And, uh, but they teach it out of order. And so even even though they provide the basic foundations of the information, it's you know they don't give you all the necessary tools. You have to figure out that it's out of order and it's grammar, logic, rhetoric, math, geometry, music, astronomy. And if you don't figure that out, you know tough to you because they still get power over you, right? right? So uh, yeah, they do provide the information, but they culture they hide it at the same time that they present it to their to their members who have been initiated and are sworn to secrecy not to give this information to other people. And what's the purpose of doing so? What is the purpose of doing so? Well that would be so that by occulting information anybody who occults information and holds it for themselves against another group and the word occult means to hide something so whoever has the information has an advantage over somebody who doesn't and uh, you know and that's that's simply ego worship and power worship lording information over other people so that you can maintain control of them what's your relationship between uh, corruption and evil and uh, you also mentioned the axiom of non-aggression well corruption and evil is really ego worship it's those who rather than seeking to empower others so that we all raise up together, they seek to only uplift themselves and put themselves and their own egos, for that matter, over everyone else and control them, the dead for their own, or the slaves for their own uh, will. Um, and uh, the axiom is really, once you learn logic, grammar, and rhetoric, the rhetoric aspect is nonviolent communication and it's being able to effectively 
disarm people in language who may be trying to attack you or you know what you do is you like uh, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg's work nonviolent communication you work from a point of understanding that person's needs and what they're not getting out of the conversation or out of the information and you try and fill that need for them so that they come down to a level to you know understand or you know bring their anger or their whatever down to a level so that they can uh, communicate back with you and then you can effectively resolve issues because otherwise if you're not communicating on the same level and if you're just you know attacking each other you did this you did that you know you evil this you evil that nothing gets resolved and then both people walk away from the conversation not having gained understanding of the other person and what happens is when you gain understanding of the other person you can no longer dehumanize them if you can no longer dehumanize them and you see them as a real human being uh, you know just like yourself then suddenly you know like uh, for instance Israel and Palestine you know if they saw the Palestinians as human beings and understood their needs and it's like you know instead of this constant fighting back and forth and this bickering you threw a bottle rocket at us and you know so we're gonna tear down one of your villages and put more uh, settlements in in your areas and steal more of your land you know then nothing gets resolved that way and one is able to dehumanize the other and take advantage of them for their own egoic gain can you talk a little bit about the Prussian education system and the importation of such into the into America and the problems with Prussian education? Well, during the war with Napoleon against Prussia or, or basically modern day Germany, uh, what happened was the, the Germans at that time trained their soldiers in the trivium and quadrivium. And then when Napoleon was coming in, invading the country, the soldiers, having been well educated and seen through the rhetoric, refused to fight and uphold the, uh, uh, what is the, the king's name in, uh, in German? I forget now. Uh, you know, anyway, they, you know, they refused to stand and die for this invading army and then uh, Prussia lost the war and what they did was they sought to dumb down their populace so that they could create better followers instead of better thinkers and so they basically developed a system that was based on, instead, rather, rather than autodidactic, basically uh, you're going to mimic or mimetic learning. You're going to basically just regurgitate everything we, we say. This was, I'm forgetting off the top of my head right now, I'd have to look it up, and John Taylor Gatto goes into this in his work, but uh, they basically in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the, the Prussian education system was brought into the United States, I believe first in New York. It may have been Pennsylvania, one of the two, I believe. And Massachusetts. Mass it could be Massachusetts. I think it was up or in somewhere Northeast. right there in that little area there. there. But it was brought in there and then it was sort of uh, you know tested out there and then considered a success and then pushed across the rest of the country. And now for that matter the rest of the world, all of the world's countries all of the world's peoples are except for the elites are brought up under this Prussian education system today. And it's, it, and it's not about creating critical thinkers and independent-minded people that are self-sufficient, autonomous, uh, autodidactic learners who can learn any subject on their own. It's about creating good soldiers, good factory workers. Um, who was it? Maybe it was uh, Rockefeller or Carnegie or all of them who just basically they wanted to create good uh, slave worker employees that didn't resist and would do what they're told and that's the the sum of the US or the, the world's education system for that matter today. But there's a number of very interesting books on this subject but I recommend reading both, starting out with at least both John Taylor Gatto's books as well as Charlotte Isabet's work, um, the what is her book, the Dumbing Down or the Intentional Deliberate Dumbing, Dumbing Down of Deliberate America. Deliberate Dumbing Down of America, and that's a, a it's a very well documented book, and she worked with uh, 
Professor Anthony Sutton, she was a friend of his who's done a lot of work in revealing a lot of this type of, of information and his work is very famous as well as uh, you know, uh, Carol Quigley goes and through uh, discusses in his books. You know, the the elite's man manipulation of everything, sort of behind the scenes. So people have to become aware of of this information, and it's through the basically through the Prussian education system that they're able to control everyone. Because if you ha if you were taught the trivium and quadrivium rather than this compulsory education that is intentionally designed to dumb you down, you would, you know, they wouldn't be able to do half the things that they do in our society. Madison Avenue would be out of business tomorrow. Council on Foreign Relations, which is public relations, uh, you know, that's all false rhetoric nonsense. That would be out of business. You know, the, the, the way the lawyers manipulate things, um, you know, commercial television, corporate news and all of this stuff, all of that would just be, it would be completely ineffective. In fact, if you go back to the 1800s and you pull out a, like a Sears catalog or something, you look in the Sears catalog and it's all about the specific functions, boom, 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 boom. What does this product do? How can it help me? You know, these are the, the things that it can offer. Today, you know, you see an advertisement for a car and it's like, oh, well, you know, if I drive this car, I'm going to get the hottest piece of ass or I'm going to, you know, get the best job and I'm going to have all these things. So these are all emotional string pulls to get people to go basically spend money or get themselves in debt from getting money from a bank that they create create out of thin air, and uh, get them in a in a state of servitude, and it has nothing to do with this product can do X Y Z explicitly. It's all of that stuff is used as emotional strings to lure the person in who no longer has the tools of critical thinking or a systematic method or a, a mental antivirus to protect themselves from this type of garbage coming in. You mentioned an interesting concept yesterday, the Latin word guber, words gubernare and mente. Could you please define what those mean? Well, the Latin word gubernare is where we get the modern word government from, and uh, gubernare, gubernare is basically to steer like uh, like a rudder or to lead, to control these 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 types of concepts, and. Uh, Mente is mind, so the word government is literally mind control. And uh, so, you know, basically what you have to realize is that if you believe in a government, you're allowing yourself to be mind controlled rather than an autonomous, self thinking individual. And the difference is, you know, a, a child is not autonomous. You know, a child requires his parents and, you know, raising and all of these things. And so until you become autonomous, until you become an adult, they consider you a child. And they're going to lead you around until you wake up and gain your own autonomy and figure your way out of the control system. Can you talk a little bit about order out of chaos? The Latin order ab chaos, or English order out of chaos, is really a, a system of governing, and it's those who are occulting information, they create chaos by doing so, and order, or the type of order that they want for themselves. And it's the same concept of boiling water. If you boil water, you see all these bubbles coming up, and it's all of this chaos, and eventually you get this sort of rolling thing going on with the boiling, and that's the order, the order out of chaos. And its relationship to Hegelian dialectic? Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, or problem, reaction, solution, and this is a type of false logic or sophism that actually only works in politics. And what happens is, you know, you, you create, a, you have a false flag, you create some form of chaos, then which the, the people react and they demand something and you've already, you already have a preset solution ready to offer them to you know protect them or to uh, quelm their uh, their outrage um, quelm that's not the right pronunciation to uh. to you know anyway you have a you know a tool ready you have this thing on the side ready to provide for them 
uh, that you've already <laughs> set out in advance that, that you want to, to lead the people towards. And a perfect example of the Hegelian dialectic, really, or a form of it, is the Republicans and the Democrats. You know, every four or eight years, you know, one creates the chaos and then the solution, they give you back the other one, and really what they're doing is they're marching the left-right paradigm, you know, and people need to understand that it's a paradigm. They're just, you know, manipulating both sides to achieve an end that's at, at, you know, in that direction. If I'm walking someplace, left, right, left, right, and doing this, it, it, eventually I'm gonna get to uh, some goal in the middle, the middle of the road fallacy, basically. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's their predetermined uh, direction that they want to lead the masses toward. You mentioned the word sophism. How does that relate to the elites and their cropping of knowledge? Yeah, the sophisticated, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, <laughs> the word sophisticated comes from the word sophism, and sophism is the really the misuse of logical fallacies and rhetoric for one's own egoic gain, rather than for you know prof, proper <laughs> proper sophia, which is wisdom. It, it would be sharing that information with others, but what they're doing is they're hoarding it for themselves. You know, and we get words like uh, philosophy, which philo is, yeah. is love, and sophia is wisdom. So philosophy is the love of wisdom. And uh, but the sophists, what they are is they are using the false rhetoric, not for gaining truth or they're using rhetoric not for gaining truth and understanding, but for controlling and manipulating the information for their own agenda. To not, to win, not to win an argument for truth, but just to win it, in other words. You know? And that's the problem with sophists. And in fact, the sophists break down into two groups. If I can, uh, there's Demosth Demosthenes and Isocrates, I believe, are the two, and Demosthenes is the one that is worshipped by Skull and Bones, 322. Mm. <laughs> and Isocrates right. is the form of sophism that can actually, actually be used for good causes, just like in logic you can use you know the dialectic you know uh, going back and forth and removing the contradictions and and uh, discussions and things like that so that you come to a an identification without contradiction in terms so this is the importance of understanding sophism and right now the, most of the sophism out there is just led to fool you by the sophisticated right. <laughs> that's why they're sophisticated it's not because they have just nice things it's because they lied and bullshitted everybody to get those nice things and uh, it's uh, yeah I recommend people looking at Demosthenes and the 322 and the origins of skull and bones for instance because that's the whole basis of how these secret societies use this occulted, hidden information to control the rest of us. People have this tendency to believe mind control is, you know, uh, some type of crazy machine that's some, affecting some type of electromagnetic, you know, interference with the mind, and some type of crazy technology that I'd see on a sci-fi movie, for example. But in in a more literal sense, this the cropping of the trivium is a form then of mind control. Yeah, you know, mind control comes in many different forms, really. Edu public education is mind control, commercial television is mind control, the news media is mind control, um, you know, people not having the trivium is the mind control, and really the trivium is the roots of the whole issue, because once you have those roots, 99.99% .99 of the rest of the techniques don't work against you. You have a mental antivirus method to spot this stuff and filter it out before it infects your brain and it's like what happens if you allow a virus into your computer you know it can wipe out programs wipe out files corrupts your system your system doesn't work well it crashes you have all kinds of problems and uh, you know so <laughs> somebody who's got viruses in their computer knows that their computer doesn't function properly it functions erratically and un, uh, unpredictably and so therefore, <laughs> is it logical to proceed to the idea that if you don't have a mental antivirus system for your brain, you're thinking erratically, illogically, you're not functioning properly, you know, you're out of balance, you've got all of this stuff going on in your head that's just junk in there affecting how 
the system should properly work. So, now you mentioned uh, many good people with good intentions don't realize, don't have this uh, system of critical thinking, and then therefore they will choose maybe one side of the left-right paradigm or not right. see through. Right. You know what happens is a lot of times, yeah, it, and it's it's very often that well-intentioned people are feeding false information and just because you know how to spot the logical fallacies doesn't mean you should automatically discount it. There's also the fallacies fallacy where you need right. to look at that information but just like at the conference yesterday there were you know a few presenters that were presenting information that they clearly hadn't fact-checked themselves it was clearly speculative clearly you know no real foundation to it and uh, you know they're feeding this information to others without checking it first and what you have to find out is is this per does this person have an agenda what is their agenda what are, what are they trying to gain from doing something like this do they know about logical fallacies if they know about logical fallacies and they're using them intentionally then they're likely you know what we would call again a sophist okay. and so you know it's important to determine whether or not the person is using the fallacies intentionally or not. Or, or, it's important to determine whether or not the person is using logical fallacies intentionally. Okay. And uh, with that you can determine does this person, is this person just ignor ignorantly spreading what uh, at the surface value with, the, you know, and like I said, watching the uh, the fallacy fallacy, uh, spreading information that they assume is true just because they don't have a, a good set of critical thinking skills, a systematic method for fact checking the information before they spread it on, or are they intentionally lying with an agenda to deceive me, to manipulate me, to you know take some advantage over me over me by occulting information? Can you talk a little bit about the causes of suffering and its relationship to the trivium? Well, one aspect of that is, and not all directly, depending on which angle it's coming from, but suffering in the sense of the trivium is that if you consider if your choices have an effect on your life, what can you do to better your choices so that you better your life? And by having a systematic method of critical thinking and processing the information coming in through the five senses, you're much more able to make informed decisions, proper decisions, so that you're not taken advantage of by someone or so that you, you know, well, for instance, if you are just eating, you know, you don't want to just put anything in your mouth. It might be poison or who knows what. You have to use critical thinking and say, hey, this is food. I can, you know, I can identify what this, what type of food it is and I can put it in my mouth and, and I know I can eat it safely. And uh, compared to, let's say, a, a small child who is just learning to crawl and things like that, wants to put everything in their mouth and they don't know what's food, what's not food, they might put something in their mouth that's dangerous, it'll choke them or poison them. And uh, so this is important that you have a way to, uh, you know, make quality decisions systematically so that you are continually bettering your life. There's a book you mentioned called The Trivium by Sister Miriam Joseph and she has it entitled Logic, Grammar, and Rhetoric. Right. Uh, what's the issue again with that? And also, well, this again goes back to the idea of uh, different institutions and in society, or secret societies possibly, that right. I guess take information out of order, because you said the trivium has to be in a specific order. Right, yeah, as I was saying earlier, the trivium has to be in a specific order, like, you know, the, <laughs> knowing the parts that you're using to build a house, the bricks, etc., knowing uh, or, uh, ex exactly what you're dealing with before you try and put something together, before you try and explain it to others. And Sister, in Sister Mary and Joseph's book, and she was a Catholic nun, and she wrote the book I think in 1937 or 39, somewhere about there. But on the cover of her book, she has, and in the presentation within, she has his logic, grammar, and rhetoric. And obviously this is taken out of order. Again, how can you have a built house before you know the pieces and parts that you're dealing with? And so by taking it out of order, she's not able to see that 
basing her religious beliefs on the Bible is circular logic. You know, it's like when you look outside and you see a tree or you see the sky or the ground or, you know, animals or whatever, these are things that you can say are created by God. But a book is, you know, a computer, a television, a car, a you name it, a, you know, bookshelf, etc. These are all things that are made by man. And if you put it in that simple context, you know, understanding that, you know, God doesn't put things in man-made things. That's what men do. And typically, <laughs> sophists using false rhetoric to control other people really like to use that kind of stuff because, you know, especially, you know, 2,000 years ago when books were very rare and, uh, you know, few people could read, you could put things in a book and call it, and, and they believed that the written word or the logos or the rationale was all, once you had written something down, it was the word of God, and that's that. And so that's the whole idea, because the logos or the written word is the word of God. <laughs> See, so then, then they can go back and point to their book, hey, look, you know, get off our land. It says right here in this book that we just happened, that our ancestors happened to write 2,000 years ago, that this is our land and, and uh, you're, you're not allowed to be here. Or, you know, just the simple nonsensical things of that sort. Can you define Lieber? I believe you mentioned it yesterday. Yeah, and, you know, Lieber... You know, the, the word liberty is very important to understand and liberal. And I, years ago when I was working uh, at the Los Angeles Times of all places, um, <laughs> back in 1997, I wrote an article called The True Def Definition of Liberal, Leftist, and Conservative. Because when I was working at the LA Times, I, it used to just really frustrate me because every day I would hear different meanings and interpretations of the word liberal. So one day when I got home, I pulled out one of my dictionaries and I started going through and understanding, okay, what is this word liberal? What does it mean? You know, and I would hear things at work, you know, and even people who would say things against the LA Times, oh, that liberal rag, really? <clears throat> or, you know, just... You know, the next day it would be, you know, it would be associated with communism or associated with tax and spend, the tax and spend liberals and things like this. Well, see, these are all the antithesis of really what the word liberal means. This is a, um, this is a false construction of the word liberal and essentially the word liberal means ever befitting the free. Hmm. And the word is derived from the Latin word liber, which is book. Okay. Okay, so in ancient times, slaves were not allowed to study the seven liberal arts, you know, and initially, you know, when st slaves were freed, typically the first thing they would often do would be to study the seven liberal arts mm -hmm. because that's what free people did, and you wanted to have that knowledge as a free person. And so the word liber is also where we get, or you know, liber is liberty, is liberal, but it's also the word book. Liber is Latin for book. So studying the seven liberal arts, grammar, logic, rhetoric, math, geometry, music, and astronomy, the books that you find in the liber Aries, the libraries, this is where the information of freedom is stored. Libraries, liberty is in the libraries. That's why the word library and liberty, freedom, is the same. And so they, they've misconstrued the information, or the word liberal in and of itself, they've spun it to its antithesis so that people don't make the connection between this false presentation of so-called tax and spend liberals, which isn't because liberals believe in true freedom through the seven liberal arts and freeing the mind, they present that, uh, this false identification with liberal to keep people from discovering the seven liberal arts and truly breaking free. Interesting. Yeah, and how does the trivium help people come to learn any subject for themselves? Well, the trivium gives you a systematic method of going through information, who, what, where, when, why, and how, so that you understand how you learn something. And uh, by having that systematic method, it's much easier to become an, an autodidact. And, you know, the, the issue with an autodidact is, you know, is understanding how you learn something rather than just regurgitating something that somebody else taught you. 
and uh, I think the trivium is key to understanding that. And let's say we're, if we're talking about, well, let, let's see, in the, like for instance, in the quadrivium, let's say you're trying to learn a song, and with you know the quadri- the music part of, of the quadrivium, without the quadrivium, let's say you go to a music teacher and he teaches you one song and you play that one song and then you want to learn another song you go back to the music teacher and he, you pay him some money and he teaches you how to learn or play another song and the process continues but by learning the foundation of the quadrivium math, geometry, music and astronomy you have a firm understanding of harmonics and of the music theory, the origins of music and the music and the chords and and all of this, so then when you go to play something, you are, <laughs> you have an understanding of music as a whole, uh, the foundation of music, and how to base something on, so you don't have to pay somebody else to, you don't have to, excuse me, you don't have to pay somebody else to teach you to play a song, you understand the core foundation, and you know how you got to it, so that you can create your own music at that point. And uh, the trivium, asking the who, what, where, why, and how, precedes the quadrivium, math, geometry, music, and astronomy, so that you understand all of these things as a systematic method going into it. And the, you know, whatever you're, you're doing, if you're using this system and looking at who, what, where, when, why, and how. I'm taking information in through the five senses. I'm processing it through the trivium, quantifying it through the quadrivium. Now I have the systematic method for how I got here. Now I can effect- effectively express it to you. I can express it to others. And, you know, we can all learn and gain from it and empower each other for that matter. You just talked about the quadrivium a little bit. Uh, why don't we go in that a little bit deeper? What exactly, what are the first... Uh what are the four books of the quadrivium? Okay, well, the quadrivium is math, mathematics, arithmetic, geometry, music, astronomy, and uh, it has to be, again, in that order. Math is number. Geometry is number in space. Music and harmony are number in time. And astronomy is number in space and time. And it's very interesting because astronomy ties into the music and ties into all of these. So it's an inclusive system. Yeah, it's an yeah. inclusive system. Right. How does a trivium kind of? Why study the trivium first and then go to the quadrivium? They, well, because the trivium gives you a systematic method, understanding the parts first, and then going to so it's a direct a, a built system, and then being able to express that information to others. Whereas without that, I mean, you could still study the trivium, I mean, you'd pr- or the quadrivium, and you'd probably get something out of it. But you're not going to have that systematic foundation. You're not going to understand gaining that that fundamental knowledge of the parts first so that you can have understanding of those parts so that you can then teach or show others the rhetoric aspects you know so you're not going to have any of that and so therefore you may you may not know nearly as well when you go through the trivium you know what you're learning how you got there what it means how it fits into a bigger picture okay why don't, we, why don't we go ahead and discuss a little bit of your earlier works um, and what you were primarily involved in before finding the trivium and uh, what was the impact upon finding the trivium uh, juxtaposed to your earlier works? Well, uh, well my, other, my earlier works, you know, my, my last book that I published was The Holy Mushroom, Evidence of Mushrooms in Judeo-Christianity. And in that book, I went through and analyzed all of the arguments against uh, John Allegro's work, the Dead Sea Scroll scholar, regarding uh, the mushroom theory in Judeo-Christianity, and revealed that by going through and systematically checking all of the sources that he used, uh, that you know, in his in, in the in the end notes in the back of his book, that ninety nine percent of the citations that he provided were valid and also providing 43, 43 uh, uh, images as well as the first primary text published on this on this topic. So, you know, it's interesting is in writing that book, I was so frustrated of how people attack things that they haven't read because the main thing against Allegro's work, and many authors experience this, is people attacking your work 
without ever reading it. They have no knowledge whatsoever of what your work says, so therefore they have no understanding, and so the rhetoric they spew regarding your work is garbage. You know, it's just noise. It's propaganda. It's sophism. And um, having experienced that myself, being an author, having seen Allegro, you know, just seeing what had happened to him and knowing that that's what he was going through and seeing it happen to other authors, uh, I in hindsight, realized that going through and fact-checking every single one of his original citations and everything and going through all of that, that was getting the knowledge. And once I gained all of the knowledge of all of those citations, especially regarding the mushrooms and entheogens, once I had all of that knowledge, I was able to go through it, filter out all of the contradictions, which was all of the 40 years of false rhetoric against him by people who had never read the work, never verified the citations, and then write a book that showed that the attacks against his work were in fact false that not only do we have the 43 images that I published in the book but you know there's literally thousands, thousands more yeah. you know John Rush has published dozens in his work um, I've got probably two or three thousand images showing various aspects of the mushroom and Christian art and um, my book before that Astrotheology and Shamanism that was you know, and I, I redid a second edition uh, a couple of years ago because I didn't like the job that the publisher had done on it, and uh, it had a number of errors in it that I wanted to go through and correct, and I still felt that the foundation of the work, which I still feel is, is overall correct, whether or not you know fixing a few minor errors here and there doesn't really negate the entire uh, concept. But in that book... It was, that's really when I just started digging in and really going through the research, uh, how it, I see it with regard to the trivium today, who knows, maybe, you know, I've found maybe 10 or 20 errors in this, minor errors in the uh, second edition that, uh, you know, maybe one day it will merit a third, but it's nothing still that changes the the concepts in the that are presented in the book, they're minor themes or minor issues with it. But having the trivium in hindsight to that, you know, I, you know, some of the things like when I was going through and recognizing all the correlations between the sevens and everything going on there, if I had understood the trivium and quadrivium, the seven liberal okay. arts, that would have been a major unlocking piece that likely if I do a third edition of that book and clean out the last few errors that have been found you know I got a very positive re- review of the book from a, a mycologist in in Holland recently and it was a very constructive review he you know he said here's a few minor issues that I've found and I'm a professional and I've you know done all this work and I you know here's the facts that I can give you on this and uh, here are the errors, but overall, this is the best book I've found on this on these subjects. And so, you know, he gave a very constructive criticism of it, and saying that overall, he still thought it was a you know a fantastic book, regardless of those minor things. So that gives me the ability to go back and correct these things. And now I would, in fact, include the trivium and quadrivium in a third edition if I ever, you know, want to. <laughs> you know, writing, you know, doing the second edition and getting ready it ready for print was about as much work as just writing a whole other book. Wow. Your book, uh, The Holy Mushroom Evidence of Mushrooms in Judea Christianity, you go into the rift between R. Gordon Wasson and Allegro, Marco yeah, Allegro. John Marco Allegro. And um, I was just wondering if you might be able to expound on some of the fallacies that Wasson used against oh, Allegra, yeah. well, well, and of kind all, of relate it back to how the trivium and logic can well, be useful well, here. Well, Wasson admitted to Jack Herr, an, an old friend of mine uh, who died last year, the father of the hemp movement, and he also admitted to uh, uh, Professor Carl Ruck at Boston University, who I also know personally, that he had never even read Allegra's books, that he, he relied on a rabbi and a, and a, uh, a Catholic monsignor uh, for their opinions of Allegro's book. So he used, he relied on an appeal to authority, basically, <laughs> instead of, the, of studying the work himself, right. and then set out to attack Allegro for the next 15, 16 years, having no 
first-hand knowledge of what Allegra's book even says, and uh, you know, using all sorts of various fallacies. You know, it was just there were so many. I'm just having a hard time deciding uh, the best ones. <laughs> well, he made up. He made up flat-out lies that uh, Allegro was seeking to gain 30,000 pounds from publishing the serialization rights in the News of the World, which it wasn't even published in the News of the World. It was published in the Sunday Mirror. And uh, Wasson doesn't tell anybody that he did the exact same thing by publishing his own uh, discovery of the magic mushrooms in Mexico in Life magazine in May or June of 1957. You know, so he went to a popular press to to publicize and popularize his work, and criticizes Allegro for following the exact same step in publicizing his work. Uh, he criticized Allegro for not using an academic publisher. He didn't use one. So a lot of hypocrisy stuff going on. Right. Um, he would do things like, uh, well, Allegro cites the work of a man who believes that the f- he can contact ancient Egyptian pharaohs through the mushroom. And then he, what he doesn't admit is that this is this man, quote-unquote, is Dr. Andrea Puharic, who is the captain of the U.S. Uh, chemical, uh, di- or the, the chemical division at uh, the U.S. Army's Fort Detrick, Maryland uh, Center, which was basically the, the area where a lot of the MK Ultra stuff was done, and this guy was working for MK Ultra, so Wasson protected this guy Puharic while he was you know, while simultaneously disparaging him, calling him just a man, but doing giving a false presentation to the to the media and to the attacks and the press against Allegro by not by not letting the public know that Puharich was in fact a medical doctor, was in fact the captain for the U.S. Army Army's uh, MK Ultra at Fort Detrick, Maryland, and all of this stuff, and so a lot of backhanded stuff like this. There, another big one that I found was that. Wasson was claiming for years that, and and uh, Jonathan Ott has regurgitated this as well without fact checking it, and you you know, and it's really Jonathan Ott who has done the most damage to Allegra's reputation mm. post Wasson because Ott published, you know, continued continued to publish it in books like Pharmacotheon and things like that. But uh, saying that Allegro had made thirty thousand pounds for the serialization rights of. Uh, of his new book, you know, he published like, like I said, it was the Sunday Mirror. He published like fifteen or twenty pages in the newspaper over several weeks, and he and Wasson made up wild claims like, uh, you know, the the headlines read "Jesus only a penis" and things like this, you know, and and the, these splashed on the headlines or on the front page of the newspaper. Not one of them made the front page of the newspaper. I have all the, the original copies of it. And not one of them said, Jesus only a pe- penis. You know, not, None of them were even close to that, or that provocative as well. Right. And uh, so, it, yeah, all kinds of stuff I've found. Right. You know, and I've, I've since found uh, evidence, str- strong evidence that I'm still... I still need to get out and get some primary uh, citations for, but uh, there's strong evidence that Watson was working for the CIA. Okay. You know, I should add that eventually I hope to finish a book on Watson that I've been working on the last couple of years, but uh, it's called uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Watson, Magic Mushrooms, <laughs> the CIA, and the Legend of R. Gordon Watson. I like that title. But... You talk about money a lot on your podcast. Well, it's interesting that you should bring money up because, <laughs> you know, as far as financial issues go, Wasson was the PR vice president for J.P. Morgan Bank, and mm-hmm. he is <laughs> what is what we can really attribute it, attribute to his creations is that he was the father of banking PR spin. Okay. And uh, it's interesting because I bet a lot of people don't. I've yeah. never made that connection. Well, you know, and the, and the, <laughs> there is a direct connection between the whole mushroom thing and Wasson's PR, and it looks there's, you know, Wasson was it appears in regular contact with Edward Bernays, if not trained by him mm. personally, 
And, uh, you know, Wasson rose to the top and became J.P. Morgan's vice president because of his spin. And because he wrote a book called The Hall Carbine Affair, where he was able to spin all of this information. But continue, you know, that's just leading from the mushrooms to economics and money. So let's go from there. Yeah, I was just wondering, you talk, you have many different podcasts uh, concerned with money. And I was wondering how the occultation of knowledge or or occultation of um, understanding what money is, the hidden the meaning behind money, how it's not been well defined in our society, and how it continues to kind of rule our lives without yeah, well, that's, any questioning. That's the primary issue, I guess, is most people don't have explicit knowledge of what money is. They can't define it. They can't identify it. Hmm. It's this elusive, always changing thing. Is it usury? Is it debt? Is it you know all, all money in our society except for coinage is is basically debt. If yeah. if all the debts in our culture were paid off, there wouldn't be anything but coinage floating around in the society. And this is all based on this, uh, you know, this usury debt fraud system that uh, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson brought into uh, power that uh, Kennedy was killed over for trying to stop it. Lincoln was killed over for trying to stop it. And Jackson, the only president to successfully kill the banks, <laughs> at least he actually killed the banks before they killed him, but not before they put a double barrel pistol to his chest and pulled the trigger and it didn't go off. So... Um, there's a causal connection between all of this. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's, a, there's probably a relationship there that the, you know, the, these presidents had woken up to the fact that the Federal Reserve was a big fraud and that, you know, the whole money system is really this this fallacy where we're giving these people to create money out of nothing and it's privatized. So then they charge us usury for our, our own money. And, you know, Zarlinga... In his book, The Lost Science of Money, he argues that at least if you know if we kept the current system in power, eliminate all of the usury associated with it, with it, it would actually eliminate a huge majority of the problems in our society and how money is used. And you put money back into society by using that money to fund public projects. You set a cap on per capita of population on how much money can be printed, and then you give public oversight directly to the people of the country to manage how the money system is run. Now, that's one way of looking at it. Some people disagree with that. You know, but ironically, you know, the concept of government is a fallacy in and of itself. And, uh, you know, the government... And the, like Clint Richardson in my podcast with him points out that the CAFR reports, the government hides billions and billions and billions of dollars in investments and things like that that has absolutely nothing to do with the money that they make from taxing us. You know, and what they don't, what these governments don't tell you is all these cities are corporations and then they turn around and they go and invest in all these other corporations and they make money on that instead of returning those investments to the public who are paying them taxes, they hide all of that. And then they constantly raise taxes and ask for more money and things like that. When in reality, if the population were given the money, and if the money that was used coming in from from these investments was used directly to benefit the public, there wouldn't be any need for taxes at all. You know, so these these uh, cities and you know, a city is a corporation. That's when a city becomes a city; is it's incorporated, and so it is this whole smokescreen of Yet they investments are. and money, and you know, using this this fake human being, this straw man, <laughs> a corporation, mm-hmm. and, and a, a corporation means a body, a corpus. Mm-hmm. Latin corpus is body. And basically what they're doing is they're giving a physical entity the rights of a human being, but it has no soul, no consciousness, no empathy. None of the things that humans have doesn't have religious views or anything like that. And so yet, you know, these this psychopath corporation, this totally... You know, this thing created solely for profits goes up and devours all of the world's resources and and kills anything in its way for profit for stockholders. You know, it's it's non-entity, and ironically, they give these corporations the right to vote and things like this too. So these all play in. You know, the money, the usury, the debt, uh, the the corporate investments, and how they hide the money. Uh, how they all of this information is occulted, and you know because they're sucking money out of us and right. energy, our 
kinetic and potential energy, they're sucking it upward into the elites so that they can continually get richer because, you know, the elites are, are really like, you know, they're like slugs. You know, they don't produce anything for themselves. Uh, you know, most of them are, are fairly unintelligent. Uh, they don't see that you know, spraying chemtrails in the air, you know, you look in L.A. every day, you just look up and you see grids all over the sky. Same way out here. And uh, how is it that they can pollute, they can do things like the the Gulf oil spill, they can create all of this pollution all over the place, cutting rainforests down for green and profit, um... Um, it's ironic that you mention um, the CAFA report because everyone can go on and view the yeah. comprehensive financial, uh, comprehensive reports, annual, annual financial, financial reports. reports. Um, yet a lot of this information we notice is out in the public. Many people can see this all around us, but there's an element to um, there's a connection there between disinformation and putting out so much information that you only leave you just leave a little bit of it hidden. So people that do use some uh, method of critical thinking can at first see, oh, I see the logic in that, but they don't realize what else might be hidden from it. And it's uh, interesting that you mentioned, and I wonder if you're in that a little bit further, about how much they hide out in, um, right in front of us, and we don't pick up on it. Well, most of it's hidden right in front of us. So who was it? Uh, Alan Dulles, I believe, who was asked, you know, how the CIA can do what it does, and he just simply said, you know, people don't read. You know, it's like going back to Lieber, to books, to freedom, you know. Reading is the key to freedom and having a, a, you know, an explicit understanding of the things around you, not passing information off to somebody else that you haven't verified yourself. You know, if you get a wild idea like, you know, there's orbs from space and they float down and they, you know, they're little things that you know that show up in cameras and then they what they do is they blow up and they scoop up large amounts of water and then they shrink back down into this finite little thing and scoop you know disappear back out into outer space i mean really it's like how is that anything other than you just created out of your own mind right now without any verification and now you're spreading that information to other people as fact you know, it's like, wow, you know, no systematic method of looking at things and studying things before you spread information to others. And, you know, and then other people gullibly take that information up and spew it back out to other people. And then we have things spreading all over the globe, like 2012, right. you know, that was created by, uh, you know, the history of 2012 is an, is an interesting one because it started off. From and uh, I've got a friend of mine, and we just did a podcast on my show last week about this with Professor John Hubs from the University of Kansas. But it started off with the one citation from Professor Michael Coe from Yale University, who made a, a small citation about something in 2012 in one of his books in 1967. And then you get guys like Jose Arguez, who just died on March 23rd, and Terrence McKenna, who died in 2000. They picked this stuff up. Oh, wait, before them, there was uh, the old TV show, uh, In Search Of, hosted by Leonard Nimoy. The premiere episode does this thing on this Maya 2012 or 2011, I think they said. You know, and so it was kind of picked up and it kind of grew from there over the years. And then Terrence McKenna takes it with his Time Wave Zero Theory and, you know, uh, Jose Arguez combines it with Harmonic Convergence. Michael Coe didn't have any citation in there. And Monument Six, the only uh, calendar stone that we have that even mentions 2012 at all, at all, only says that a king will be clothed or dressed. Has nothing about doomsday, you know, uh, Daniel Pinchbeck's the, you know, the return of Quetzalcoatl, an Aztec god who's, you know, he's he claims that he's the incarnate of an Aztec god, a Jewish beatnik author is the incarnate of an Aztec god who's here to teach about a Mayan calendar. It doesn't even make any logical sense. There's no, you know, talking about removing contradictions and primary identification, just the foundation of his claims are absurd. You know, he's like, you know, what systematic method do guys like Pinchbeck use to verify I am the incarnate of Quetzalcoatl, an Aztec god, here to teach you about a Mayan calendar, <laughs> right? 
you know and, and it's just and people pick this stuff up and regurgitate it and share it yeah Hollywood is making horrible Woody Harrelson films you know <laughs> spreading this stuff out even further and uh, you know a total elitist movie the elite are going to build an arc and save themselves and you know shorten the gene pool so that you know the, the greediest and most degenerate of us all are the only ones to survive <laughs> yeah. you know you just mentioned 2012, and I was, it's interesting that all these uh, ideas that come from certain people, such as McKenna and Arguelles and Pinchbeck, how they've been so blown up in our culture, and uh, people seem to not have a way of uh, getting to the source of a lot of this information. They seem very gullible and willing to spew out a lot of yeah, exactly. Well, you know, since what the hasn't been verified, and they yeah, assume they, the person, I guess, that wrote it. Since the trivium and core thinking has been removed from everybody's curriculum, they're basically a bunch of sheep, you know. Mm-hmm. And people get caught into that stuff, and that stuff is mind control. And um, you know, there's many others other than just those three that I could name. You know, there's a whole movement of people, and they go around and they hold these conferences, charging three hundred, three hundred fifty dollars a ticket, selling complete nonsense. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the real history of the Mayas, the real history of the Mayan calendar, the real history of this stuff is far more interesting than these yeah, sure. science theories that they, you know, that they blow up. And then what they'll do is they'll say, oh, you know, well, the, the scientists, they just, they just, they're haters. They don't look at all sides, you know, and, you know, that's not true. I talk to scientists and doctors all the time, and they look at all of this stuff. And, you know, if you have a systematic method, grammar, logic, rhetoric to process information, who, what, where, when, why, and how, before you, you know, before you go out and relay all this information, you have this systematic method to filter it, not only before it enters your own brain, but before you pass on false information to others. And that's, it's, it's critical. Right. And so, you know, this, it's this whole lack of, of these having these skill sets that allows things like the 2012 meme or, you know, the lizard alien meme or the, you know, David Icke's newest one. And I, you know, and I think David Icke has a lot of really excellent work actually. But the problem with David Icke is he's, he does these fantastic seven hour interviews, but an hour, an hour and a half is taught is, you know, is him talking about, you know, lizard people and how the moon is a spaceship which, you know, he's got two t- citations out of unverified New Age books where somebody else just had an idea, a little thought of intuition that they didn't verify, and they put that in there. So now David Icke is having seven-hour lectures where he's pushing that out to more people without verifying it himself. And instead of, you know, if he took out of his seven-hour lectures, and I would say five and a half hours of that is excellent research on mind control, on education, and a lot of things that it's done. But if you would replace this noise, this junk of the lizard stuff, and the the moon is a spaceship, he would gain credibility, and instead he should place in there, in my opinion anyway, critical thinking like the trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and empower his audience with real skill sets that when they leave his lectures, they go out into the world empowered and know exactly how and what to do and how to spread these empowerment tools to others. But, you know, and I've, I saw one of uh, David Icke's lectures recently, and I thought for the most part it was excellent, but he didn't pro- provide anything in these lectures that, that when people walked out of there, they were empowered. And that is a really key issue. So, you know, I, I guess in a way I got to call out David Icke to try and or, or for him to take this on. Well, I guess I think believe, uh, yesterday you mentioned, I believe, how people will cut out the leaves or the well, right. stems of the tree right. without yeah, going happens. to the actual right. foundation, the yeah, roots exactly and the trunk. Right. Yeah. You know, and so without the trivium, without the critical thinking skills, yeah, you can give all of the people all of this information, all these conspiracies, all this wrong stuff that's going on out there. And it's all of these little pieces, the, the branches of the tree and the leaves and everything. You can beat at that, you know, if the tree's big enough, you can pre- beat on it your whole life before you ever get down to the roots. You know, so why not focus on the roots in the first place and empower people with their own minds if you give them one subject that teaches them how to think not what to think 
then when they know how to think, they will automatically, when they start understanding the logical fallacies and all of the other things going on, all of the other stuff will begin to unfold and they will see it naturally. So give them those tools first. And then, you know, I'm not saying not put out the other information, but give them the tools of critical thinking first so that they can identify things on their own and understand how they got there instead of trying to spoon feed it to them and not leaving somebody empowered and fully <laughs> able to you know to have knowledge understanding and wisdom basically when they leave the lecture right. I want to kind of move into a different topic right now. You mentioned many times on your podcast, well, much of your podcast is centered around, obviously, psychedelics. And also, a topic not very well known in psychedelics, or people don't tend to look at it, about mind control and the use of uh, different government programs towards mind control. Oh, sure. And, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the trivium could help with the entheogenic process as being able to filter out some of the good information, the bad information coming in, and how the government sure. also uh, tried to use yeah, well, psychedelics you know, and the, reprogram people. Well, we, why don't we start off with uh, MK Ultra? Okay. You know, the MK Ultra in the 50s and 60s, you know, from Par Project uh, Bluebird and Project Artichoke and all these things, this was U.S. government, you know, and uh, is, in my opinion, Gordon Wasson was probably involved in this. Uh, Albert Hoffman was not only... Uh, uh, Hank Alberelli, who's the leading expert in MK Ultra. He's going to print soon with a soft cover edition that's going to have new evidence that shows that Hoffman was not only French intelligence but also CIA. And oh. Albert Hoffman is wow. the creator of right. LSD. Completely different picture. Right. And, you know, they were creating these things to, you know, for warfare, for their little ego worship, you know, and they would go out and test unwitting civilians at their will. They would set up brothels and things like that. And, um, you know, dosed people, and several people committed suicide, including, uh, well, they claimed that Frank Olson committed suicide, but actually, when they had, uh, he was going to blow the lid off of, of uh, a mind control test that they did in, in France at uh, <clears throat> Pont Saint Esprit. Yeah, in yeah. France at, at Pont Saint Esprit, where the CIA dosed a whole village and like five or six people died, and. You know, all hell broke loose in this right. place, and uh, they covered it up for for years. And and Albert Hoffman even helped them cover it up, cover it up. And so there's there's a history of these things being used for mind control. In fact, if you go back to ancient you know like tribal shamanism, when the shaman would break you free, your your mind is in a different state, and you can easily be reprogrammed at that point. You know, and it's like cults and all sorts of stuff are really. You know, uh, that's a point when people can be really easily conditioned when they're, you know, they've woken up from the major religions, they go, aha, that's bullshit. And then they come down and all of a sudden they fall right into all the New Age propaganda, which I call a second catch web that's sort of there to keep people like lost and confused for several years or hopefully forever to the elite's terms before they, you know, wake up again and realize that the New Age movement is also largely disinformation. You know, I'm not saying that there's not valid information within it, but, you know, a large portion of it is, is junk med meant to mislead people. And, um,. Anyway, remind me again, sorry. And the importance of um, the trivium in relationship so, to anti, uh, and, antigenic usage. So, okay. Sorry. And so, the, you know, by people, if, you know, in my personal opinion, before somebody gets involved with entheogens, which I personally experienced entheogens more than many times, um, I think it's essential for people to have a systematic method of critical thinking to understand logical fallacies, understand grammar, logic, and rhetoric before they have the entheogenic experience. Once they have that core foundation knowledge, then the entheogens act as a tool to engage all of that. And that's, you know, my personal opinion is that the proper use of entheogens and the trivium are identical. Like, the experience is almost identical. I've had yeah. uh, very similar experiences from both. And, 
It's, uh, you know, when you get on the same page with somebody and you're understanding exactly what they're saying by picking up what they have to say and reading it and studying it, that's what it means to get on the same page. That's basically in the trivium, like, you know, what people who have psychedelics would say is a telepathic experience. And when you truly get on the same page with some with somebody, you really walk in their shoes. You understand the information that they're trying to get across. And to me, now having studied entheogens for 20 years, I, I think it's risky for people, and you see it all over the place, how easy to bring down the whole 60s psychedelic culture. None of them had critical thinking. You offer them credit cards and SUVs, and they run off and become yuppies, you know, and that's the end of the battle. And uh, so here we are, you know, 40 years later, we're still, 44 years later, we're still having to deal with all of this stuff, and now all of the, the 60s counterculture that grew up, you know, they failed, in my opinion, not because of the psychedelics, but because they weren't using, you know, they didn't have a systematic method to give to people once they woke them up with psychedelics. Sure, tune in, turn on, drop out, but what happens after that? You know, once you turn on, how do you keep it on? What's the systematic method to keep you turned on to the big smoke screen that, you know, the big matrix that all, that's all around us? And so critical thinking, understanding how you can be lied to and manipulated and, and mind-controlled is key you know, to using enthugens safely. I just picked up this book called The Controversy of Zion by Douglas Reed. I'm wondering if you've ever heard of or read that book before. Yeah, I've read about, uh, I, I just picked it up a few months ago or a couple of months ago, and I've read about 180 pages of it. And uh, I think the information that book contains is some of the most disturbing stuff I've ever come across. It basically fills in the gaps between Anthony Sutton and Carol Quigley and the information that they're not uh, providing regarding the history of Zionism and some of its more racist uh, and for that matter New World Order aspects that lie behind it and <laughs> you know it's uh, I don't want to I don't want to spend too much time on it right now but I think everybody should read the controversy of Zion especially you know people living in Israel, for that matter, because if they saw what was really going on behind Zionism, what Douglas Reed has laid out in this book, I don't think, you know, most sane people would never support that type of behavior. And uh, it's there's some, let's just say there's some really disgusting history there that really needs to be brought to light and given a lot more attention. And, you know, the main issue is that they're trying to drive a wedge between Jews and Gentiles, or, or the Jews and the cattle, <laughs> the chattel so-called, right. the goyim, and uh, get us to fight between each other so that, you know, the Zionists can, and uh, other is, you know, there's a handful of other groups. It's not just the Zionists, but the Zionists have literally <laughs> usurped the Jewish religion in a way, and, and even Judaism in itself. You know, there is no Jewish race, and I had Professor Shlomo San, the author of uh, Inventing the Jewish People. He's, he's, a, he's a professor at the uh, University of Israel at Tel Aviv, and he proves in his book that there is no evidence at all for a Jewish race, that it's strictly a religion, that 85% of the Jews in the religion came in through proselytizing and through like the Khazarian king in the 8th or 10th century converting the whole kingdom over to Judaism for basically economic gain. And, you know, there is no Jewish race. 90, 85% of the Jews out there today are Ashkenazi. And they have no relation to the historical Palestinian Jewish people at all. And um, so this has become sort of a, you know, a smokescreen, the idea of this Jewish race. And then, you know, Ashkenazi said what they'll do is they'll throw out the word anti-Semitism whenever Israel does something. And they hide behind this smokescreen of... And what that does is that, oh, you hear anti-Semitism. Oh, well, I don't want to look over there. I don't want to be a racist. Well, it's not about racism. It's about a smokescreen. And if people realize that 85% of Jews out there aren't Semites at all, and in fact, if you look at an, an old Webster's or Oxford English Dictionary, you'll see right there under the word uh, Semite is an Arab. And so, you know, the people who are 
doing the most atrocities to the Arabs are the Zionists against the Palestinians. So isn't that at blatant, iron, er, ironic face value, anti-Semitism at its worst? You know, when you go in and you bulldoze people's homes down on a regular basis, you put up walls, you make them, you know, walk through three hours of security gates and stuff to get to work and things like that, and then you have the audacity to question why they want to launch bottle rockets at you and and fight against you when you destroy everything and you call them goyim or, or cattle, they're you don't consider them human. You know, and there's quotes from I forget someone recently said that. I'm not even going to mention it because I can't remember the exact quote off the top of my head, but there's some horrifically racist stuff there. And, uh, in fact, the word race itself, it's basically, what is a race? It's whoever gets to the finish line first, right? So, you know, you have all these different races, quote-unquote, of, of people on the planet basically racing to be the supreme, the one race, the chosen people, right? And if... if there isn't, I, I can't think of a more racist concept than a bunch of rabbis, and like I said, you know, books don't grow on trees, but a bunch of rabbis writing down, you know, two millennia ago or more, that they're God's chosen people, that this land is theirs, that anybody else is scum, should be killed, should you know, never eat with... Uh, with, uh, you know, goyim that's like eating with the dog, or it's okay to, you know, steal or kill a, a non-Jew, it, you know, just all this kind of stuff that you find in the Talmud, it, it's it's disgusting. But if, if people knew the foundations of Zionism and the history behind it and how the state of Israel was created, I don't think any logical, sound-minded person would possibly be behind that. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, that could garner quite an emotional response. Uh, people, that's something many people don't like to look at. And Absolutely. it's interesting and that... And it's all of these trigger things are there, and that's why the trivium is so important, not reacting emotionally to information. Especially when information controversial. Comes in, right you look at it here, you know, it's like, you know, I pick up this beer, I don't have to become the beer. I can sit here and I can read the label and I can taste it, I can smell it and I can get an idea of it, and then I can put it down. I don't have to become that beer. And so by you know realizing that we can study information without becoming consumed by it, you know, we can look at things from a critical standpoint, not an emotional reactive standpoint, and analyze the information properly. And you know what, if you're following any religion that tells you that you can kill other people and you know your God is a jealous God and has all of these insecurities and stuff going on and, and is really a God of, of destruction and as John Allegro points out, a God of fertility as well, you know, is that really something that you need to be blindly following without critical thinking? And you know, there are, I know, I have many Jewish friends, and, you know, it's not, the, the issue is critical thinking. If people had critical thinking, I don't think anybody would believe in any of the dogmatic religions, whether it's Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism or whatever. People would create their own religions for themselves, not to go sell to other people, but their, for their own identity of who they are as as a being. They don't need an, an intermediary. They don't need a priest or a rabbi or a you know, anything else to tell them how to find God. And it's like going back to psychedelics. If you study all of these ancient religions, like John Allegro pointed out, which I, as you know, I showed in my book, The Holy Mushroom, backing up his work and, and providing primary ancient texts you know, that discuss, quote unquote, the Holy Mushroom, the title of my book, you see that, the, you know, that they. These people in the past were creating these religions from the use of these psychoactive substances and writing these stories down, and then somebody comes along and, hey, you know what? We make a literal history out of these stories. We can control the whole planet. You know, So let's use this for sophist purposes instead of empowering people. So it goes back to empowering people with the trivium, giving the critical thinking so that they can see through the lies, so that they can see that these, you know, these, uh, these, the circular reasoning that's behind these religions behind the, the Bible and the Talmud and things like that, if they realize that this is circular reasoning and all it is doing is causing us to dehumanize each other and not see each other as human beings who, uh, you know, who deserve 
respect and consideration and caring because human beings, you know, for the most part, until you make people nationalist and, you know, and you get somebody up there with the flag, go kill those guys, they're different, they're going to come over here and tell you you can't drive fast in a circle, go get them, kill them all, you know, it's like, unless you have some guy up there using false rhetoric, most of that stuff can't happen. And it's by giving people the tools of the trivium and critical thinking that they can analyze the information coming in, who, what, where, when, why and how, again, so that they can go, ah, I'm, you know, I need to investigate this. I don't need to become this idea, this dogma, this belief. I'm not going to, because basically when you take on a belief, you end all other thought. You're saying, okay, I have all the answers. I don't need to learn anything else out there. None, nothing else around here. Is, has any value to me? I've made up my mind on this one point, and if you know that's a very sad state, in my opinion, to be in. You know, and you don't want to be just open-minded either, allowing any kind of crap into your head. You know, and, and accepting it at face value, like the New Age movement does. Right. You need a systematic method to take what's good, throw out what's bad, and keep the rest. You know, or I said that. So. Yeah, the trivium is the core of all of these issues. How did this knowledge, or when, let's just do kind of a little review of history here. How did this become occulted or hidden in the first well, that's place? A good, and that's a really good question. Well, let's focus on that first. And, you know, in our education system, it appears it was taken out in the 1850s, and you see, you see it, a residual of it up all the way until 1910s, 1920s. And, uh, you know, so it took a good while for them to get a lot of that out of our culture. And I would say that, you know, if you go back to uh, Alexander the Great, he got pissed at Aristotle for Aristotle publishing a book on how all of these techniques work as well. And because you know, uh, Alexander the Great wanted to mind control everybody, and Aristotle was like, well, let's just empower everybody. and but that just you know it didn't go over well, and uh, Alexander the Great was was Aristotle's student, and uh, so he you know Aristotle got in some big trouble with the emperor when he when he did that, and so there's a history of it, and it, and it appears to come in and out at different times throughout history. Even you know it's like the Prussians had it, then they removed it when Napoleon comes. Uh, if you go back into like uh, letters from the Civil War and here in the U.S., the the soldiers writing these letters are extremely articulate and uh, far more articulate than the, your average person today. And so, you know, it, it appears that most people during that time, even though we like to claim that they were unschooled and most of the population was illiterate, I'm I'm in sort of I sort of often doubt that, and you know, we would need to go back again and ask who, what, where, when, why, and how, etc., so that we can find out more details of exactly when it was removed in the U.S. and how that was taking place. I know, like uh, John Taylor Gatto covers a lot of this in his uh, book, The Underground History of American Education. You know, and if you read his, you know, some of the reviews on Amazon on that side, it's, you know, people do have some issues with the citations in that area. And so some, you know, some more weird work needs to be done there to, to uh, drive to an identification of the issue without contradiction. How's your, how does this knowledge relate to certain um, renaissances or golden eras during history? Well, it appears or, that and the, through yeah, sacred it, societies as well. It, it appears that the, that the European Renaissance came... Uh, after the reintroduction of the trivium and this knowledge from the Arabs in the Middle East. And it had been, you know, the Dark Ages is basically when they removed the seven liberal arts from everybody's education, then Europe fell into a dark period. And you know, it's kind of ironic that now in many ways... In the middle, you know, the Middle East, the the Muslim countries have are they're kind of in a, a dark age now, and they're actually the ones that gave it back to the rest of the world, you know, <laughs> and so it, that would probably be an interesting study in and of itself, the in and outs of of the trivium and quadrivium and through history and the rise and fall of different cultures and peoples and yeah. wars and yeah, you mentioned Aristotle being persecuted as well. I mean, well, not really persecuted. Early, he, pers- you know, he, I I don't know to the level of what he got in trouble for that. I would have to look back at that. It's been a little while. 
It's going to say there's a relation there between later, though, with the Galileo and his persecution by the church for just yeah. trying to give knowledge from yeah. his observed. And, you know, and that's, you know, people accept a dogma at face value and they don't want to look at any other new information. I've right. made up my mind, don't confuse me with the facts. You know, it's, it's one of my aunt's favorite sayings. <laughs> In what way has the 19th century and the 20th century uh, philosophers contradicted the need for or expounded upon the disillusionment between themselves and Aristotelian logic or the need for just the trivium in general? Well, I would go back even to 18th century philosophers like, uh, wasn't Kant 18th Yeah, that's right. And Hume, I believe, was also early. Kant, he's really the, the foundation of irrationalism today and uh, you know he's been disproved many times uh, by a few different re- few different people I'm going to be having uh, Dr. David Harriman on my show soon to discuss all of this and, and Dr. Harriman completely disproves quantum physics quantum you know quantum theory is based on Kantian philosophy and Kantian philosophy is full of holes and um, you know it's it's <laughs> These, a lot of these different philosophies like Kant and Hegel and in, in some part Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche as well, they've had a, a pretty negative impact because they didn't understand the trivium as a whole, as a functioning system. They didn't get how it worked, so they couldn't see the corruption of their own logic. I think Nietzsche probably figured it out right before he died. But, uh, you know, usually <laughs> at that point when you're dying of syphilis, it's a bit too late. Right. How does the Kabbalah relate at all? Or are some of these ancient mystery traditions that people tend to mystify but actually has a relation to the trivium yeah, and quadrivium? Yeah, it does, in fact. You know, the trivium ties into the quadrivium through the golden ratio, and then the quadrivium ties into the Kabbalah through sacred geometry and through basically the patterns in the, in the Kabbalah tree of life. And... Uh, you know, there all of these things do tie together, and it's very fascinating when you see that how you know how the quadrivium plugs into the Kabbalah, straight out of math and critical thinking, right? But the, the Kabbalah can be used for good as well as bad. The Kabbalah has a very dark side to it as well, and and a lot of people you know, will say, oh, well, the Kabbalah is devil worship. Don't study that, you know. And it's like, no, it's the opposite. If people are doing bad things with it, it's your ignorance of it and how it works that empowers them to use it against you. Why wouldn't you study that to disempower them? It's the most important concept you'd like people to take away from this interview. Think for themselves and study the trivium. Understand that the trivium is the foundation to the tree of knowledge (laughs) and that... uh, you know, stop whacking at the branches of all of the problems that are going out there. Give people, you know, see, the, the thing is, is education and topics like the trivium can be, can be approached non volatilely And so instead of saying, you know, there's lizard people and stuff like that out there, you know, or even, you know, valid topics like hemp or economics, money, entheogens, all of these different topics out there, Give people the proper tools first, logical fallacies especially. You know, have them watch a video of logical fallacies or just hand people, you know, somebody a list of the logical fallacies. And so, you know, and then that way you can say, oh, well, that's this logical fallacy. Or, you know, once you have that understanding, people will see the logical fallacies coming at them. But not only that, they will begin to filter the logical fallacies in their own minds and going outward. <laughs> so that's really <laughs> Hold on. We disempower all of those groups by giving people the trivium. It levels the playing field. The only way you can be controlled is by you, you know, by these others with the trivium. The trivium is can be used for bad just as well as good. But the only way it can be used for bad against you is by you not knowing it.